last week as I was wrestling with that portion from the letter to the Philippians that Justin just read, I took a break to open a big package that had arrived at my front door. It was a large box packed with obvious care and sent at no small expense by a childhood, childhood friend whom I haven't laid eyes on since the sixth grade. Inside the box was this huge photograph of my father mounted in a gilded frame taken when he was about 34 years old. To the frame is added a brass plaque which reads H. Richard Copeland, pastor, 1955 to 1964. See the resemblance? <laughs> the story of how this very evocative but rather awkward treasure arrived is so moving for me that it affected the way I read and heard this passage from Philippians and at the risk of committing the sin of TMI, too much information, I, I feel compelled to share the story with you. This portrait used to hang some, in some hallway at the Beacon Hill Presbyterian Church in San Antonio, Texas. It's not hard to imagine a long hallway with similar uh, pictures hanging in a long row. I don't remember that picture hanging on a wall at the church. My twin sister and I were three years old when we were brought to San Antonio, and we were 12 when Dad took a call to serve a church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I have some wonderful memories of that church, however, and how kind and generous the congregation was to the three preacher's kids who were the pastor's children. Those mid-50s and early 60s were heady days for American religion in general and for Protestants and Presbyterians in particular. The suburbs were springing up all over the country to house the GIs who were coming back from the war. Families were flocking to churches and many congregations were expanding their programs and building new buildings. While Dad was pastor at Beacon Hill Church, the old sanctuary was converted to a shiny new education building. The pastor's family moved out of the old manse and out to the suburbs where the congregation had built a brand new manse. My twin sister and I moved from an inner city school where several of our classmates spoke Spanish to a nice suburban school where most of our classmates looked and sounded just like us. I remember very vividly the pencils that were in the pew racks in that sanctuary. They were white, they weren't red. They had a picture of a church with a tall steeple and a family going through its open doors. A little girl in the family was dressed in her best Sunday dress, and a little boy had on a bow tie. And printed on the barrel of the pencil were these words, church-going children seldom become delinquent. <laughs> While we were in San Antonio, uh, a Roman Catholic was elected president of the United States, much to the dismay of my father. And dad preached a sermon series entitled Christianity versus Communism. Members of the John Birch Society were prominently in attendance for those services, notebooks and pens in hand, taking notes to use as evidence against my dad should he say something on American. By the metrics of the day, Dad's pastorate in Beacon Hill was successful. 
New members were added to the roles, programs grew, buildings were built. When dad left, the church was still riding that tide of post-war uh, building and so-called progress. I don't know all the details, but in the years that ensued, the Beacon Hill Church began to fall on hard times. The neighborhood around the church continued to change. The families who drove in from the suburbs began to get older and began not to make that journey so often. And all the time that was happening, the world was changing so fast. Shortly before we left, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Next came the protests over the war in Vietnam, the sexual revolution, that huge cultural readjustment that just hammered the establishment. All institutions, including the church, came under, became suspect societal pressures to join the mainline Protestant church, those kind of went away and there was no longer any advantage in being a good member of a prominent church. Over time, the median age of the congregation at Beacon Hill went up and the size of the membership role went down. There was no money keep up the buildings or to fix the leak in the sanctuary roof. As it was declining by worldly standards, the congregation there began to reach out to their neighbors in brave and innovative ways. The church became a gathering place for musicians and artists. Many community groups were given keys to the building to use for their meetings. Beacon Hill became known as a church that welcomed everybody. But hospitality alone does not pay the bills. On the first Sunday of last month, the church had its final worship service and the Presbytery officially dissolved the Beacon Hill Presbyterian Church. Anyone with a connection to the church was invited in subsequent weeks to come and take away a memento of their choice. And so my Facebook friend Bruce, who was in the same Sunday school class as I was and sang in the same children's choir with me and my twin, he returned a couple of weeks later and he took that picture off the wall and he bundled it up and sent it to me. After 117 years of ministry, the Beacon Hill Church ceased to exist. There was even a small article in the Tallahassee Democrat that appeared the day before the final service. Yesterday, while gazing at my dad's strikingly handsome picture, <laughs> I, I couldn't help but, but picture the Apostle Paul sitting in that prison in Rome, reviewing his own past and all the churches that he had served. In today's passage from Philippians, Paul is tallying up the score according to the metrics of his day and his culture. If there had been a who's who in the first century, well, Saul of Tarsus would certainly have merited a lengthy entry. His pedigree was impeccable. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. By the prevailing standards of his culture, Paul was the creme de la creme. To this impressive pedigree, he added some personal achievements. He had studied with the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, who had been a doctor of the law and a member of the Sanhedrin. 
He was an impeccable Pharisee whose zeal for the law knew no limits. He'd even taken on as a kind of personal project a campaign to purge the tradition of those troublesome sects of Jesus followers, those Jews who, who admired and honored this discredited rabbi from Galilee who died that unspeakably shameful death on a cross. Paul was a persecutor of the church and proud of it. He was, by all the metrics of his tradition, a good and faithful servant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, the typical Christian conversion story sort of runs like this. I was sinking deep in sin. I was a hopeless failure. I was at the end of my rope, and then Jesus came to me, convinced me I needed to repent, forgave me my sins, and saved my soul. Well, that was not Paul's story. Paul was doing fine. Paul, in fact, was doing better than fine. He was doing great. Then Jesus came into his life. He met the risen Christ. He came to know the self-emptying Son, whose hymn he was singing in last week's passage, Saul, the impeccable servant of the law, became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And in the course of that journey from, Damas from Damas Damascus onward, Paul's perspective began to change. In today's past passage, he looks back on his life and realizes that all those sterling credentials and that perfect pedigree aren't worth a hill of beans. They're rubbish, the New Revised Standard Version politely translates. A more blunt translation would be, they are dung. They are so much horse manure. Whatever gains I had, Paul says, I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Forget the graduate degrees and the postdoc work with Dr. Gamaliel. Forget the slaps on the back from his fellow religionists for his efforts to snuff out heresy. Forget the chart on the wall that tracks his progress on the pharisaical F-cat. Compared to the surpassing value of knowing the self-emptying Christ, all of those credentials count for less than nothing. Paul's reflection on his past shapes his expectations for the future. He no longer measures faithfulness in terms of success or failure, but rather in terms of knowing Christ and making him known. He yearns to share Christ's sufferings, by which he does not mean to wallow in masochistic misery, but rather to be fully human, as Christ was fully human. He wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection to rely not upon a self-generated righteousness, but upon the righteousness from God based on faith. Paul now knows that the righteousness we try to generate on our own inevitably leads to death. But the righteousness based on faith that always leads to life. If we live, we live to the Lord, Paul wrote to the Romans. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. A year or so before the saints at the Beacon Hill Church were officially disbanded and transferred to other churches in San Antonio, I made a decision that caught the attention of the national me news media. Uh, 
a group of Roman Catholics, people who were part of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered community, found themselves without a place to worship. The bishop had kicked them out of their parish church because they were worshiping openly, acknowledging who they are without being quiet about it. So the session of the Beacon Hill Church did a brave and some might say completely foolhardy thing. They opened their church doors to these displaced sisters and brothers. You can come in, they said. You can break the bread of life. You can share the cup of salvation among us. You can be who you are and we will not judge you so long as we remain the church of Jesus Christ. You are welcome. The Beacon Hill Church of my childhood, where all its strengths, could never have said such a thing to a group of Roman Catholics, much less to a, an association of LGBT believers. Back then, we didn't know enough vocabulary even to have that kind of conversation. And my dad, who was as faithful a pastor as I have ever known, could not have imagined such a thing in 1954. But we learned. Like Paul, we learn perhaps more from our failures than from what the world regards as success. We learn to judge less and to empathize more, to quit the numbers game and to take up the cross, to regard as loss the metrics of a kingdom that is passing away, and instead to regard as gain the death that leads to resurrection in the new kingdom of God's justice, peace, and love. The church doesn't exist anymore as Beacon Hill Church, but their, their website lives on in cyberspace. The mission, site on, the mission statement on the website is a very simple one. It reads, we're here for good, for God, and for you, our neighbors. We're here for good, for God, and for you, our neighbors. That doesn't read to me like an epitaph. It sounds to me like the good news of Jesus Christ. The Book of Order has a curious passage, curious by worldly standards, but entirely consistent with Scripture. It says this, the church is called to undertake its mission even at the risk of losing its life. Trusting in God alone as the author and giver of life, sharing the gospel, and doing those deeds in the world that point beyond themselves to the new reality in Christ. Back in 1954, the future of the church looked rather different than it does now. Who knows what forms the church might take in the 21st and 22nd centuries. But so long as any congregation is willing to risk its life while sharing the gospel and pointing away from ourselves to the new reality in Christ, that congregation will be the church of Jesus Christ. For good, for God, for neighbor, the church dies and the church lives. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.